Welcome everybody. Um, I am Lane Kopfleisch, the CEO and founder of To Be Consults LLC. And I'm currently main, my main office is in Española, New Mexico, in Northern New Mexico. And throughout COVID, I've been seeing families both online through Zoom and in person. Um, and working on what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight, this is the culmination of a three-year project. Um, for a book that is not yet released. It's coming out September 21st, um, but I have been doing some training, teacher training in the state of New Mexico since May. So it's been really fun to share in state um, in anticipation of that publication date. And the book has just said, it's, it's teaching to every kid's potential, simple neuroscience lessons for liberating learners. But underneath that, that sheath, um, I wanted this book to be for everyone, um, not just for teachers in formal classrooms, but for anybody, because it's based on um, knowing neurologically that we, we have, there are a few fundamental misunderstandings that we've had um, up until now. And now that we have neuroscience tools to explore ourselves a little more in depth, um, there are some things that we need to tweak in our habits that could greatly influence our quality of life and our mindset and even self-esteem, which is why I'm, I'm excited about this talk tonight because this is the first unveiling in a public forum of the message that really applies to everyone at any age in any learning situation. And so what I hope you get from this evening's talk are a couple of things that literally you, could, you can hold in your hand and say, oh, I'm gonna think about this part of myself differently after tonight. And I'm so relieved to know that. And so these, these are the things that we're gonna uncover together in the next hour or so. Okay, let's see. So I am, I'm trained across psychology, medicine, and education. So I'm an educational psychologist, which means that I care about features of the environment that either promote or inhibit learning or someone's ability to learn or show, show what they know. But as a neuroscientist, I'm in, interested in what goes on inside and, and all of the mechanisms um, that create all of our individual differences from differences in how we learn, from mental health diagnoses, from learning processes. Um, I wanna know inside how all of that emerges. And if you put the two together, it's a process that I call a fitting process. Um, helping people get into situations that optimize their own skills and abilities and talents, um, and also helping people to understand and give them the skills to go forward in their life to be able to sort out on their own behalf when things are working or not working and why that might be. Um, and within the state of New Mexico, there's been a huge push and focus on early childhood education and the, the state plan, basically, this, this little piece that I pulled out, it said early intervention um, or services should be um, for early intervention, they should be culturally sensitive and they should be trauma informed. And it mentions that there's a disconnect between systems that don't work together. And once upon a time in the beginning of graduate school in the very early 90s, um, I made a decision to train across these fields because I knew there were a lot of cracks. People fall through a lot of these cracks between these disciplines and I wanted to try to remedy that. And so, um, so here we are tonight having this grand discussion that I hope, I hope will benefit you quite a bit. So why? <laughs> the big question is why? Well, first of all, education um, is supposed to be improve our lives, our quality of our lives and our learning. And people are suffering in the name of education, but it's supposed to make everything better. And the second principle, and this is the principle that drives my practice to be consults, is that when you have neuroscience and we're able to learn about ourselves, um, science papers are the story of the grand mean and the group average. Um, you need a certain number of people to participate in a study so that you have statistical power to derive the inferences and, and pull the knowledge out about ourselves. But on the other side of that, those people are individuals and they're individuals with differences. 
And so I'm able to go between both of those perspectives to go into the science and find the stories at that level with the right statistical power and, and the good experimental designs, but bring that information forward in service of the individuals that I serve in my practice, which are families, children, um, organizations, sometimes helping at the systems level, people to understand um, features of learning and individual differences that they don't. And so the remedy for this, kind of the turning point we're in right now is that we need unlearning and because we've got some bad habits to break. And we need something called positive peace. And positive peace is um, uh, the letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, Martin Luther King, when he wrote that letter, he distinguished uh, between positive peace and negative peace. And we've been living in a whole bunch of negative peace, which, which is essentially waiting for the other shoe to, shoe to drop, waiting for things to happen. Um, but that is not positive peace. Positive peace is the presence of justice. And when you have positive peace, uh, the body, the mind, and the spirit can completely relax and open um, in that, that promotes optimum learning. And so what I'm gonna share with you tonight, hopefully, is going to help you experience this shift between the, the quiet anxiety and the promotion of a situation that's life enhancing and enhancing to your quality of life. And so in my mind, what really, what really is the goal of education? And if you look at the bottom of the screen in bold, really the point of education is for you to have choice and life quality, right? You wanna be able to choose the environments that suit you. You wanna chase the passions and dreams that excite you. Um, and you don't want doors to be closed because of a lack of training or a lack of experience. And so really the goal of education is, is to um, hold these things for us into our adult lives. And so how we get there matters. And these are quotes from the conclusion of my book but I wanted to highlight them on the screen because cultivating brains that are flexible, ready, connected, and understood by others and themselves prepare people to appreciate and cultivate a balance between autonomy and relatedness or what some authors call having roots and wings. And if you educate to those things, says my book, these are the premises, you create an adaptive brain that can manifest as an ability to respond to a situation no matter what life throws at you. Um, there's a saying that says it isn't what happens to you, it's how you handle it. And having an adaptive brain is, is, is your ability to handle what comes at you and comes toward you. And so what I would like to do before we go further into our conversation is share with you a commercial that's been produced for the book by the Arrowhead Indian Business Enterprise Center uh, in Las Cruces at New Mexico State University. And one of my COVID blessings was getting connected with this organization um, because they've been quietly helping me behind the scenes anticipate the book release um, get marketing things ready and providing financial um, counsel and support. And so I'm very grateful for them. Um, I'm connected to this center because I'm Ojibwe from Northern Michigan. So I was born in Indian, Northern Michigan, but I, I live in Indian life among the Pueblos in Northern New Mexico. And so let me share this commercial with you and then, then we'll go forward. As an educational psychologist, I care about what features of the environment help promote or inhibit what somebody knows how to do. As a cognitive neuroscientist, I'm interested in the internal processes that make all that possible. But here's the irony, people are suffering in the name of education and it's supposed to be the thing that makes everything better. So my book follows certain paradoxes about how our brains learn and highlights certain biases that keep us from recognizing learning potential in our children. And so in my book, there are five key things that I'm gonna teach you 
I'm going to teach you to befriend distraction. I'm going to help you deepen the role you play in influencing the quality of learning that happens on your watch. I'm going to teach you to recognize the behaviors of executive function and how skills and abilities or disabilities might mask our opportunity to see the roots of those behaviors. And finally, I'm gonna help you find a simpler way to identify and address those behaviors that stymie your best plans. If we want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. And my book is a blueprint to help make that possible and help that plan unfold. This book assembles great knowledge from science in service of the individual so that you can apply these strategies and make use of the insights in your own teaching and on your own behalf. As okay, educational... so thank you for letting me share that with you. Hopefully it kind of brings my introduction full circle and makes you excited for the rest of the talk. Because as I said before, tonight's talk is about everybody, not just children. Um, the obvious applications in education may be for children, but um, the chapter three on connection is actually very heavily based on my work with my adult students at Northern New Mexico College in Española, a group of 35 people, adults with families, teaching in classrooms already, but who have come back to school for their degrees. And um, a, lot of, a lot of amazing things came out of a semester run with, with this group of people, and you're gonna hear about that tonight. And so it's kind of scaffolding into the adult conversation. What I, what I wanna focus your attention on is who are you as a learner, as a problem solver, and or as a creator? Um, and I have a picture of a seesaw here because there's a lot, this is where a lot of the misunderstandings emerge and how we are actually built to learn and to create. And there are certain things that we have tried our darndest to distinguish or extinguish in ourselves. Um, and teachers have tried to extinguish on our behalf that have made for some pretty uncomfortable, stressful times. And um, we're going to uncover those, and I'm going to um, hopefully make you feel a lot better about certain moments you may experience along the way that actually may be actually helping you do what you do, and you just didn't know it. And so here are the ideas that we're going to focus on. And in, there are four chapters in this book, and four chapters only, because I really wanted each of these themes to be prominent. And the good science in the science of learning right now to inform those ideas, because this is where we need to, to myth bust a little bit and understand ourselves. And so the ideas are around the role of distraction. Did you know that distraction can be used strategically to enhance learning and memory? It's not a bad thing always. Same thing with mind wandering or daydreaming. The same thing with procrastination and what I call masking behavior. And masking behavior is when thing, one thing covers up another. And I'll, I'll be showing you some examples pretty soon here. And so the book opens um, with me introducing four neurological imperatives. This is what I call these. Because when I sat back and um, this book, I went through two, um, two editors. And so in the second editor, I was talking with her and I said, you know, people don't need to know every single thing about the brain and that the anatomical names, um, but there are certain things that if everybody understood differently would make for much, much greater learning opportunity and quality of life. And so these are those four things. And I sat back one day and I thought, if the brain could talk, what would it tell us about how it wants to be developed, supported, and cared for? And these are the four things I think the brain would say. It would say, help me be flexible, responsive and adaptive. Help me be ready. Help me be and stay connected and be unmasked. And that's, can, can the person who I help run around this earth in this body, can they understand me and what's going on? And do other people have the right set of glasses to also see certain kinds of, of behavior? 
And so these four chapters are about uncovering these, these findings in the science of learning that can help turn us around a little bit. And so just so that we're on the same page, here are my definitions of each of these pieces. Flexibility, cognitive flexibility, is your ability to move between contexts and tasks, go from A to B, um, to respond to something that surprises you or an unanticipated demand. Um, to give attention and emotional resources to the social environment and to respond appropriately in the moment, no matter what happens to you. So that's flexibility. And there's an ease in flexibility. And there are key moments where we're not flexible. Trauma, um, being upset emotionally, sensory overload. There are a lot of times when we're not as flexible as we could be, but we can prepare our brains to be optimally flexible so that recovery is easier. Readiness. Readiness is being excited more than scared and showing what you know and can do. And being excited more than scared, notice I didn't say readiness isn't being stressed because stress is a big part of readiness, but we just have to understand it as a medicine and not as a bad thing and how to stay in the range of stress that is medicinal and good for us and helps drive our nervous systems successfully. And then connection is the relationship of a person, thing, or behavior to someone or something else. It's the act of joining or being joined to something else. And it's the experience of feeling close and connected to others. And our brains need to be in networks, need to be in networks. They run best when they're in networks. I'm gonna share uh, a few slides down about an experiment that my laboratory did looking at people problem solving in a hierarchy versus a network and show you what happens. And then finally, masking is preventing something from being seen or noticed. And we've got lots of examples in the mental health world where people don't know what they're seeing. Um, an example from the autism world is that women are much less likely to be diagnosed early in their lives than men. And as adults, they grow up to be hypervigilant, to be highly anxious. And when men are not properly diagnosed early enough in life, they have greater incidences of depression. So the chapter four in my book goes heavily into uh, dismantling what we think we know about autism and repositioning it into something that I've started to think about as an autism. It's not, we already know it's a spectrum disorder, but um, people can have an autism. It doesn't define who they are. Another example is stealth dyslexia. I work a lot with very bright children who come in for testing because they may be high achievers, but their journey along the way is fraught with stress and emotional overload and breakdown and nobody knows why. And usually what's driving it is something called stealth dyslexia. And it means that that person there, they might even be awesome readers. They might be very proficient readers, but there are smaller perceptual processes in memory that make that harder for them to do. And their brains have to work in overdrive to facilitate that process. And so they run out of gas more easily. They're more temperamental, they're more irritable. And, um, and it all kind of, you know, it's the princess in the pea. It dials down to this one tiny little piece of cortex about the size of your pinky fingernail um, that is deflecting the information that it's supposed to be absorbing. Um, so that's a big, that's a big mask in, in um, developing kids, especially. And then my, my other example here is hyperactivity because hyperactivity can be caused by many different things. And unless you know what the right root is, you, you're not gonna be able to help a person turn a corner on it. And so you can have an attention deficit, which is you know low, lower levels of dopamine than a brain typically produces. You can have that. But a person who's hyperactive could be on too much allergy medicine kids on corticosteroids for asthma and breathing issues. Um, steroids can cause hyperactivity. Uh, lack of sleep can cause hyperactivity. Emotional trauma can cause hyperactivity. 
boredom in smart people can cause hyperactivity. And so that's a wide array of processes that on the surface can all look like somebody who's you know, not, not doing what they should be more active than normal. Um, and unless you know what, what, where it's driving from, you're not gonna really be able to help that person. And so to kind of purely punctuate this, this is one of my favorite quotes from our current US Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo. I have the pleasure of knowing her and um, I was introduced to her actually by a composer, um, an indie, another native friend of ours. And um, shortly after I met her and was talking with her about uh, teaching um, in some programs that I was supporting, I found this quote and it, it came out of an interview that she did some years back with the Legacy Project. And it says, I have learned to step back, to take the time, if possible, to process what's coming at me. I don't wanna be a person who reacts, but rather someone who acts gracefully and calmly from within, no matter what comes at me. And when I found that quote, I thought I'm putting this in every single one of my talks because it's exactly what, it's exactly what I mean. This is the kind of brain that we wanna help groom in all of us, ourselves and other people. And so when you look at skills that are important in today's world, things like perspective taking, being able to step into somebody else's shoes, um, empathy, being able to really feel what someone else is feeling, we know that musical experience and training um, help create a more resilient, distraction-resistant brain. And we want people that have that resilience and brains that have that natural resilience, um, people with self-knowledge and a sense of discovery. We know that exercise helps support modern skills. We know from studies in aging that a brain in a body that exercises, that the parts of the brain related to memory don't age. They, they kind of arrest at, at a level where a person is maximally, optimally active. And we can do that for ourselves. And we all know it's good to get exercise in a general way. But neuroscience is showing us specifically what happens when you take care of your body and your brain this way. Um, and then finally, knowledge acquired through more than just study. And this is where life experience, the apprenticeship, mentor, the mentor and the guide become really important. And not just in, you know, in children's education, but in how we grow and enhance our lives as adults. So just to give a, another point on that, neuroscience is showing us that acquiring experience and expertise in music influences the development of other skills and even academic achievement. And when you think about what music is, it's a giant coordinating system that puts you in an emotional moment with whomever else is, is sharing it with you. And so the ability to enhance a brain and make it more resilient to distraction um, it's because it's that it has that that coordinating ability to multiple systems in our brains to bring them together. And the one of the pioneering studies of this is there's a lab at Northwestern run by a woman named Nina Kraus, and she is an auditory neuroscientist. And they several years ago looked at high school kids for over a two year period of time and. For two years, those kids were, some were doing an exercise intervention and others were gaining in musical expertise. And on their tests and measures across that training study, the kids that were becoming musically competent, their brains were the ones that were more resilient to distraction. And that was measured by faster reaction time speeds to certain cognitive tests. And, and keeping track of how they were doing and what they were doing. So this is a, this is a big deal because I don't, I don't know too many people that don't like music. You may have very specific musical tastes, but just about everybody that, that I know likes music in some form or another. Okay. And so this is why I think it's important to reconsider mental health and learning. And the book, 
makes a huge argument for the teacher's mental health in the classroom. But if life is a classroom, we're talking about mental health for all of us. And when things aren't going right, when you're in a situation that feels traumatic or uncomfortable, you're here, you're, you're sitting between a rock and a hard place. And that's not a really fun place to be. And so um, as I've been working with early childhood teachers over the last three months, we focused a lot on what trauma does to learning. And I wanna bring that into tonight's discussion because the extension is that mental health issues create a parent and hidden trauma that people live with every day. And when, when you have a mental health issue that even changes your daily reality, um, that can be disorienting. And when you're not sure what's happening, it just compounds that feeling. And so we're in a time where we cannot risk that trauma remains camouflaged and hidden within the fabric of our society, our geography and our learning communities and our families, because we need, we need to get to the heart and the root, like I'm trying to share with you this evening. And trauma is certainly hidden in the recesses of people's minds and hearts until it appears in a behavior and often to the naked eye out of context which masks the skills, abilities, talents, mindsets, and behaviors that characterize a person when they are present and they are well. And everyone experiences those moments. And sometimes they could be more fleeting than you care for them to be. But what I hope I share with you tonight will help you anchor to being present and well, and you'll be able to hang on to that. And so when that happens, why does it have that effect? Well, I'm gonna just spend a couple of slides talking about the physiology of stress, not just because of the bad things that it can do, but also because of the positive things that it does. But I think about a stress response in the body as an adrenaline moat. So here's my little castle and the moat and the, the very narrow drawbridge over that moat. And so that's an analogy for looking at brains in this fashion. When you are unstressed, you have tight control of your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. And you have that coordinated system across your cortex. It's like listening to your favorite symphony or complex piece of music. Everything is in concert with each other. And you have access to your, what I call your own natural resources. But when you are stressed or overly stressed, notice the squeeze. This is like squeezing the washcloth. You know, all of the good chemistry bouncing around your cortex when you're, when you're well and have access to all of your faculties um, gets tightened up and wrung out. And what sticks after it rings out are the stress hormones, which cause weaker control of thoughts, emotions, and actions. And not only that, but your brain doesn't necessarily change size, but the, the amount of access you have to it does. And that can be summarized in this curve. This is the yerkes dodson law, which shows us how anxiety affects our performance. And here's the tippy top, which is kind of the optimal level to be where um, you, have your, you have attention and interest in what you're about to do. If you're a tennis player, you're on your toes, ready to volley, it's that feeling at the top of the curve. And that's why a little bit of stress is a good thing because if you're down here with low arousal and, and weak performance, this is kind of couch potato status right here. And then as your interest increases and you're getting motivated and excited, you're here. And then if you become too, too stressed, you tip over into this right hand side of the curve and you head toward impairing your performance because of really strong anxiety. And when you get over here, it can take some time to climb back up that side of the hill because when, when these stress chemicals get going, they're, they're very strong and they're very hard to stop once they're, once they're in process. They get kind of addicted to each other and so that's where this moat comes from because chemistry floods your brain. And so what's in can't come out and what's out in the world for you 
doesn't have any entry point because it's blocked from stress. And so this is a, a functional example of what happens. And I know everybody has personal, personal experience with too much stress and not being able to function well, but I thought it was, I wanted to tell this story because this was a study done by a team where they had developed a virtual town. They had people devise a shortcut to reach a target. And so this is where they were starting. And, you know, maybe, maybe this is your favorite store, your favorite grocery. Um, but the people in this study, oddly enough, they allowed themselves to be subject to moderate electric shock, which would cause an automatic release of stress hormones. And when you look at all of these lines, these, these are the routes that people took to go to the target object. And so here is, if this is your village or town, you know, you're just walking about the city blocks, but obviously the optimal way to go is, is through this spot. But then after electric shock in this study, people start here and they could still wander these others paths, but the familiar route was the one that they defaulted to, even though it wasn't the most efficient. And so you could think of it as when you're too stressed, you kind of revert to your most primitive habits and your most primitive instincts, even if they aren't the most optimal ones. And that happens to all of us. My message isn't to say we have to extinguish this completely because I don't think it's possible in the complex world we live in, but to be aware that stress can do that and, um, and take that effect is nine tenths of the way of saying, I'm gonna change that habit. I'm gonna change my self care. Um, I'm gonna prioritize things in my routine that are gonna keep me out of that. And so the moment where I do get surprised, um, I'm gonna have my, my wits about me. I'm gonna have my faculties. And so this is what we want because we want access. We want that big green brain that has access to everything. And I call those the good neurologies. This is in the book. You want the good neurologies because we all have these features inside of us. We have the capacity to, to release too much stress and cortisol and adrenaline, but we also have an ability to keep it in check. And some of the things that help keep it in check are our, what I call our connection chemistry, oxytocin. And oxytocin is the chemistry that bonds us to our families and our loved ones and our communities. And during COVID, you know, we're not supposed to hug, we're not supposed to be proximate to each other, we're not supposed to touch. And I can tell you, watching children and families in my office during COVID, uh, we developed the pinky high five. And so when, when a moment arose where you would typically have that outreach or that touch, we stuck out our hands and we would touch pinkies for just a minute, just a second. And that's all you need, just a tiny little bit of contact. Um, you know, when you're babies, we swaddle babies to comfort them. And a long time ago, I, I worked with rats in a research lab. And one of the first things we were taught is that if we were holding an anxious animal, that the way we could calm them was to touch their spine and that that would cause an automatic, autonomic relaxation. And so, um, you know, don't underestimate proximity and touch, you know, the top of a head, the back of a neck or shoulder, you know, those are, are benign, um, benign contact, but to our chemistries, they promote a good neurology. They promote a sense of connection. And when you're, when you yourself or you're with somebody who's struggling with that, a very simple way to change the dial, to turn the dial on that is through touch, even if it's very brief. This, oops, the second set of, good, of the good neurologies are, is dopamine, the chemical dopamine. And dopamine drives that motivation. It's the top of that, of the stress curve. It's how we get into flow if you're a creator, um, or no matter what you do, we all have moments where it's six o'clock on the 
on the timer and two and a half hours go by and it's late and you think, oh my gosh, where did the time go? You know, and those are the moments where you just completely fall into what you're doing. Um, and in the, in the clinical world, it can be called hyper-focus, but hyper-focus doesn't have to be bad. It can be very positive if it's productive. But here's the next piece is that trauma or anxiety um, tricks the nervous system into believing it's on its own. That's, that's where stress has its power. Um, and I think that's, that's why mental health is so important because it's a hard barrier to break. As I said, once it gets going, what's in can't come out and what's out can't go in. Um, and so it's important in yourself and in, to be able to recognize um, and in other people what the help signals are not necessarily from a person saying help, um, but what help signals are actually coming from their behavior. And um, when you're hyper-focused and it's not a good thing, it's usually when there's a perseveration or a rumination or overload. And um, in perseveration, this it's a key, can be a key feature of mental illness. There's a persistent focus on one thing and it's, it's, a, it's a very specific focus, but it isn't productive. Whereas hyper-focus is a good thing because there is a specific focus, but good things are happening in that moment. Uh, rumination has, it's the same as, as perseveration, only it tends to be on negative feelings or stress. And there's a neat study that I talk about in the book. Um, there was a team that looked at people walking in urban environments versus natural environments. And what they learned is that people walking in urban environments, while they were physically getting exercise that was good for their bodies, um, their mental health wasn't that great, that they were tending to ruminate on things that weren't right. And so, you know, you think about what the benefits of exercise are supposed to be, that mentally you can kind of release and let go. They learned that people walking in urban environments tended to get exercise, but they, they were more likely to ruminate. Whereas people walking in forests and natural settings um, reported, you know, their minds were wandering, they were able to kind of forget the world. And so it's important to know when you're going through the motions physically, um, but maybe blocking a, a benefit mentally. And sometimes you can't help it. Um, my point is in saying that the help signals are coming from the system, not the person, is that if you, um, if you live with a person with mental illness, they might not recognize in a moment the help signals because they're just experiencing them but externally you can recognize that something's happening and maybe that's that touch on the shoulder, um, the pinky high five, the, the touch on the head. How are you doing? Become proximate, you know, use the good neurologies to counter, counterbalance what's happening um, in that moment for that person. And that's a very small adjustment. You know, these, some of the things I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna say, oh, of course, or, oh, I already do that. And, um, you know, tonight's talk is just to tell you that there's a lot of powerful science coming on board, showing us where these seemingly small actions are really powerful and, um, and lead to uncovering these, some of the other things we're gonna talk about, about that we've had complete misunderstandings with ourselves. Okay, so onward to the rest of the talk. And this is where a lot of us have been. <laughs> what is that? Oh, it's just my mind. <laughs> you know, and the, this has been the state of our minds in the pandemic. And things are, are, are busy now for different reasons. And I hope positive ones for all of you that are listening. But back to that, what happens if a, if a mind is stuck? What happens if there's perseveration and rumination? You know, that's a lot of what anxiety and depression are. And so what I try to do in the book, and I will describe each of these very briefly, is 
how do you how do you help somebody get unstuck? How can you help yourself get unstuck? And so for perseveration, that's the intense focus on that repeat of an action. And joint attention, bringing your attention to that person's is what can help disrupt a perseveration. You know, in young children, we talk about distractions, create the distraction to bring, you know, a crying child out of a temper tantrum. But, um, you know, it, it, no disrespect that we can do that for each other as adults too. And, and join attention is a powerful way to do that, whether it's a pinky high five or, or a touch or some other gentle diversion. For rumination, rumination may resemble perseveration as excessive thinking or talking about something painful. And it can cause problems with concentration, energy, and motivation. Why? Because rumination keeps the stress cycles alive in our bodies. The, the chemistry of stress stays alive during rumination. And so one thing you can do is to turn to a hard task, a hard problem outside of yourself. Um, there's a, a saying that says, when, when you're unsettled with yourself, go help somebody else. And that, that's a message to coming downstream. But a person who, who really values um, thinking, uh, you can help them ease rumination by introducing hard, open-ended problems or puzzles. Uh, think about mazes. Um, think about um, other games and, and visual puzzles that might engross a brain analytically without the baggage associated with it. Um, because when you're intelligent and in dealing with these kinds of things, sometimes you're, you are your own worst enemy. And so just a straight on some kind of hard problem it doesn't have anything to do with you. That is another way to disrupt that chemistry and get a person back on, on even footing. And then the third, flow, and this is not a bad one. This is full and total immersion in a task or a project. But um, especially kids, kids with hyperactivity, they are notorious for being able to tip over and hyperfocus. And they go so deeply into something that they don't hear their name. And you know, you might experience this too, where the world goes away. Only the world has demands. I'm going to turn this back. The world has demands. And so it's hard to climb out of that state very quickly. You need to ease out of it. And so one of the things that I do in my practice is I teach people to see time. And I, I have a slide that I'm going to show you in a few. But working with sets of hourglasses that are one, three, five, 10, 15, and 30 minutes, um, that's a superpower, teaching people to see time. And I do it every day. And it helps dissolve power struggles between parents and kids about, I want you to stop your game in 10 minutes and come set the table for dinner. And that never happens. And it happens only after knockdown, drag out, everybody's stressed, nobody's happy, nobody likes each other anymore. And um, yet if you can put down a 10 minute hourglass that everybody can see and say, okay, in 10 minutes, I want you to make this shift. And person might not quite be ready at 10 minutes to make that shift. And so that's what the three and the one are for. And you say, okay, I know you're almost there, but let's tip three minutes or one minute. And then I really need you to be able to shift. And I've seen a lot of issues dissolve by teaching kids to see time um, because they feel like they have more agency and power and families um, reducing their stress over those moments that are just designed to coach routine and habits that sustain your life. And so what else about being stuck, especially as adults? So the brain finds fairness rewarding. And I bring this up in the conversation about being stuck because sometimes stuck happens because people have a sense of, in, of injustice about something. And mental illness, as I, as I mentioned before, it can be disorienting because when it's severe, your day-to-day -day reality 
changes and can shift in ways that you don't anticipate. And so there are lots of moments that may not feel fair or that you anticipate. Um, and then once you're in them, the, the power balance isn't comfortable. And so what do people do? They lock down, right? They hold, they stick. Here's why that's so powerful. And this again is in the conclusion of my book, but it's, it's a very powerful message because when we are as young as three years old, we are capable of picking up on inequities and imbalances of power in verbal exchanges. Three, like kids have their words by three, but that is a very sophisticated perceptual ability. And we don't, we don't tend to give our young kids credit for that, but those are instincts that we're born with. And that's why they're so powerful and hard to shift. And my argument is that we can't shift them unless we really understand our own operating diagrams. Um, in my office, I call them playbooks. And I, I do psychoeducational evaluations for children and adults alike. And, you know, it's the, the same tests that um, people are given in clinical settings by neuropsychologists. But the outcomes are a little bit different because comparing somebody to the norm of people their average age, that's, that's only half of the story. That's the group, that's the norm, that's the grand average. Um, but then back to the point that people are individuals and have stories and you have to fit that back in context. So some of my most favorite moments are giving people their playbooks. Um, hey, here's your operating system. And now that you know it, you're gonna be able to avoid things that stress you out and pick things that enhance your natural abilities and skills and your life's gonna get a lot better. And in kids, that's usually IEP meetings and family coaching, but for adults, it can be equally as powerful um, because it's, you know, knowledge is, knowledge is, is half of um, being able to fix a problem. And so here's another one. At eight months old, we pick up on inequities and imbalances of power for behavioral inconsistency and nonverbal cue. How people relate to each other and treat each other. We are capable of detecting those subtleties at eight months of age. And so we wonder why, why the rumination, why being stuck, why the stress and anxiety, especially in mental illness, because these are ingrained instincts that we are all born with and that express before we're even really consciously, you know, thinking on high levels. Other essential, but not so basic skill sets we are all born with that function soon after birth. Our ability to detect agency, who has power in a situation, imbalances of power, auditory inconsistencies in speech and language. There's a scientist in Seattle, Patricia Cool. Her studies uh, looking at infants and their ability to detect um, subtle differences in the Chinese language versus the English language, um, syllables and inflections that adult ears no longer hear, they can hear. And here's the other one, deception. And so, you know, if we could really internalize this, that nearly from the beginnings of our lives, we are loaded with perceptual abilities that should empower us on our own behalf. Um, but this hasn't really been brought to the fore. We don't realize that in educating and caring for somebody that um, the reasons it gets hard sometimes are because of these ingrained instincts in ourselves. And knowing that we can, we can help develop for the better. And so here's that last piece that I hinted at earlier. People are faster and more accurate problem solvers when they work as a team in a network structure because each person has a skill or knowledge that contributes to the whole and one mind doesn't have to manage the challenge alone. Now that doesn't mean that hierarchies are bad because they're necessary for structure, but the point is that when, when you have a hierarchy, a person on the bottom of the hierarchy is not just managing 
what their problem space is. They're also distracted by monitoring. They're monitoring their own sense of safety. Um, am I doing it right? Am I, it, what's my supervisor gonna think? Um, is this gonna get taken out of context? I hope it doesn't. All of these worries and anxieties around a pecking order put somebody at risk and distract their brains. And so I'm gonna continue to unpack that over the next several slides. But again, the brain finds fairness rewarding. That sounds like a fairly innocuous statement, but there's a lot of power in the skills that we're actually born with that, that are functioning before <laughs> our full presence of mind is. Okay. And so how does this all come out of us? You know, if this is what we're made of internally, there are a set of skills that determine the quality of how we show what we know and can do. And they're called executive functions. Um, they all sit in nuclei in the frontal lobes of the brain. Um, and they all develop at different trajectories. And the big insight and important thing to know is that it takes 25 years of age for all of these skills to fully mature. And all of those skills fall really into two containers, your ability to manage yourself and your ability to manage everything else. And so self-management, those are things like inhibit, inhibitory control. You don't say or do everything that floats into your mind. You have a filter, but some people struggle with inhibition of action, of words. Shifting, how stuck are you? How well can you go from task A to task B? And then finally, emotional control. So these are the skills of self-management and, and they're important ones and they're, they set the stage for the ones that come next. And that is your ability to manage everything else. So working memory is how much can your brain grab onto at one time in the service of solving a problem. Um, multitasking, none of us multitask well, even though we're, thought, we're taught to believe that we can our brains don't do it well. And that's, that's working memory capacity. Task initiation, how much of a self-starter are you? You know, are you capable of saying, I need to get that done, I'm gonna get that done, and then you move on to the next thing. Lots of people struggle with, with that. Or there, are, there may be one certain thing in your life where you know, you're a good self-starter in other ways, but not in that one area. And then there's planning and organizing. And that's both mentally planning your tasks, but also your physical space. And so this is a this is a tall order, but these are the skills that bring out what you've learned and what you know how to do. Um, and 25 years old, think about all the things that happen before you're 25. People graduate from high school, college, marry, drink, drive, go to war. I mean, there are a lot of consequential things that we do before our frontal lobes are, are fully there to guide us. And so when I talk um, in the office or in coaching situations with people, I like to talk about, instead of strengths and weaknesses, I like to talk about seedling skills or natural strengths. Because among all of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven skills, nobody gets all strong ones or all weaker ones. There's always a composite. That's part of your playbook. Our brains are as unique as our fingerprints. Um, you know, I mean, you've, some of you have given your fingerprints for security clearances and teachers, you know, being able to teach kids a lot background checks. But, you know, you could subject your brain to that as well, because even though we all have the same general regions and a cortex and and cerebellum, the, the operation diagrams are highly personal. And so when I'm working individually, I like to talk about seedling skills and natural strengths. And in the education world, there's always a hot debate about how do we teach these? Do we teach a study skills class? And then the kids will know how to self-start and plan and organize. Well, that never works because if you don't learn these skills in context, they don't stick. And so it's much kinder and more neutral 
to be able to say to someone, here are the immature skills. You know, a hyperactive person, a seedling skill might be inhibition. They might be having some issues, not, not having a filter. Maybe they say things they shouldn't say, do things they shouldn't do. Um, and inhibition is a seedling skill. But maybe they're really smart and their working memory is enormous. And so if you give them a hard problem, uh, you're gonna see amazing things come out of them. And I see those inconsistencies and gaps all the time. And it just defines what a person knows and can do and where they are in that development. And so those are seedling skills. Natural strengths, those are the things that you do without thinking about them. And so when I share executive function definitions with people and, and they look appropriate for their age, you know, I just say, you probably don't realize that you have a planning strength um, or that being a self-starter is, that's an important asset or tool that you hold. And people just say, oh, well, that, I just do that. You know, that's just what I do. It's no big deal. But in this composite, it's important to bring that out as a natural strength because it helps bring along or compensate for things that are weaker. And so as an example, you know, shifting from A to B, that's one of those skills of self-management that has a lot to do with how flexible someone is. So that first principle, brains work best when they are flexible. And so I put this together to help you think about, hmm, I probably shift better in some situations than I do in others. For some people, routines help them be flexible. They don't have a problem with the routine. I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna brush my teeth, I'm gonna eat breakfast, I'm gonna go run, you know, and it takes them through their day. There are people that find comfort in routine and that helps you shift. There are other people, you know, who don't like routine and it's the last thing that they wanna do is be subjected to, to a routine. Activities that you like to do, everybody shifts fairly well among activities that they love to do, right? Think of your favorite Saturday activities. You know, you might have a list of things you love to do and have my favorite cup of coffee and my favorite cup, I'm gonna go for a run, I'm gonna come home, I'm gonna watch a, you know, watch a movie, like no problem with that. But if you were to replace those activities with routine or things that are expected, but not your favorite, you know, might not shift so easily. And then emotions. It, it can be very hard to shift out of negative emotions and back to the strength of rumination and perseveration and trauma that when you get stuck there, it's very hard to shift. and. Um, and so, you know, your ability to do that depends on the context and some things are easy, some things are hard. And so what we're learning from the science of learning are that building blocks of flexibility, and it's never too late to learn, are that rhythm, music, and play are three things that are emerging as like gold standard ways to support and facilitate cognitive flexibility. Rhythm, because it coordinates attention systems, okay? Brings things into the same space. And music has the ability to do that. And in the book, I distinguish between rhythm and music because I advocate for using tools in the classroom to coordinate attention. Things like soft chimes, things like shakers that sound like falling rain, um, auditory signals that aren't alarms, that aren't disembodied sounds coming out of nowhere, but that are used very intentionally to entrain everybody's nervous systems. Um, and I will tell you that this summer, I've been running a, a program to test what I've been doing individually with people in a group setting. And I have a basket of egg shakers and I just put them out and they're all different colors. And so of course, um, the, my staff and, and the kids involved in the program, everybody's like, what are these? Oh, they sound so good. And I just make a simple statement that when you wanna get someone's attention, 
or if myself or one of your teachers shakes an egg and you hear that sound, it's just, it's, it's an invitation to come back and to please listen and come into attention. And I tell you what, in, in one day, kids are doing it to us too. It's, it, it's not just, you know, Dr. K shaking an egg or, the, or one of my other teachers shaking an egg. It's kids getting our attention that way. And, and it's really neat because it's very gentle and it's a nice way to coordinate in a group instead of shouting or disembodied alarms or other noises that could be startling to nervous systems that might be a little bit stuck, okay? And then music, as I said, involvement in, in music and gaining expertise provides the brain with a protective effect. It seems to guard against distraction. And, you know, why not? For goodness sakes, why not? And then play. And that one seems obvious. But what does play do? Play teaches you to learn how to navigate surprise, novelty, and social complexity. And, you know, in children, we take a lot of, we take a lot of reasons to play away. No recess, no music, no art, no theater. Um, but as adults, our lives, it can be very hard to save time to play as well. And especially when you love what you do, but it's a really important feature of caring for your body and your brain and your nervous system, because it does, it keeps you supple and flexible to be able to contend with things that might come up that would otherwise surprise you or jolt you out of a moment if you're stuck and consumed with something else. And so one of the other executive functions, uh, shifting is a self-management skill. Working memory is one of those managing everything else skills. And what it does is it bears the weight during learning something new and how much information you can grab onto. Um, it also determines how well you deal with distractions from the environment, noise, social conflict, physical comfort or discomfort, and your own sense of safety. And I mean, I think everybody could think of moments among friends, classmates, even family members, where there's a difference in how much somebody can handle in a given moment. And the, the insight coming out of the science that everyone should know is that even though this is a feature where people are very different from each other, like, you know, you're, you're waiting on someone because they just take more time all the time to do what they need to do. Um, maybe you're really quick and you find yourself waiting a lot for the environment around you and you prefer to be in situations where you kind of drive the, the pace and the speed of things. Well, all of those differences in working memory what the science is teaching us is that everybody will come around to the same point. If there is a, if there is a need to cross this finish line, everybody will get there. And that's an important thing to know because people's doubt and judgment in different moments can just squash everything. And so I want you to remember the next time you are waiting on someone or in a moment where you're not meshing with the people around you or vice versa, that it is possible to get to get to yes, to get to what the end point is supposed to be. Everybody will get there. Um, in the book, I talk about that as a boomerang, that everybody has different trajectories in their boomerang. And some have low boomerangs and some have high and some take longer than others, but you can get somebody there in, in a learning moment where there's a goal that people are working on together. How does that happen? This is kind of a throwback to what I was just talking about for flexibility. Giving joint attention to something um, can promote flexibility. These are the shakers. I keep these in copious amounts all over my office and people take them and I love it that they take them because that means they will use them. Um, drums for that rhythm away to bring uh, people's awareness to a present moment in, in a way that isn't stressful or upsetting or jarring. 
And so these are the hourglasses that I was referencing, being able to see time and using these to transition yourself in tasks and other people in your family or, or around you. I usually tell parents 30 minutes is an eternity in a young child's life. Put that one away for yourself. Put that one away for big projects. Um, but, but keep the one, three, five, 10 and 15 and use them you know, intermittently. And as I said before, I can tell you a lot of stories where stress is dissipated in families because everybody learned how to see time. Um, and one of, the, one of the most powerful transitions is getting um, people to put their technology aside for the day to sleep, to eat, to give time away from blue light before, before it's time to go to bed. Um, having a set of these around is a really gentle way to work with your family or people around you or yourself. And so what I want to do now is give you a couple of strategies um, from the book. And I'm just looking at our time. Okay. So our senses can play among each other on our behalf to help us. And I often tell people, use your eyes to help your brain because your eyes are a powerful part of your brain. And a story about this comes out of studies about phantom limb, people that lose limbs in accidents but still feel like they're there. And there's a famous story that I think I've told this group before um, where there was a, a gentleman in a motorcycle accident and he lost his right arm and his treating neurologist for 10 years was treating him for depression and anxiety because he could still feel that arm and he could feel his fingernails gripping into the palm of his hand. And so imagine living, not being able to allay that kind of a feeling. And so this neurologist, his name is Viliana Ramachandran, um, really famous guy now and a very nice man. And um, he went to Home Depot and bought some lumber and a mirror and took a hammer and nails and put a box together um, that to the naked eye, if you, if you stuck one hand in with a mirror to your eyes, it looked like that there were two hands there. And so he had this, this gentleman put his good arm into this box and he said, I want you to open and close your hand. And he did that several times. And as he did it, the phantom pain went away and he started to cry. And so that is an example of our visual systems overriding the pain. And so these are much more portable. You don't need a box. Um, if you're not allergic to nuts, you could have almonds and cherries for this. I call the strategy almonds and cherries. And that's because in the anatomy of your brain, the one piece that is responsible for all of that enormous stress chemistry, it's called the amygdala. You have one on in each hemisphere. And that piece is the piece that tricks your whole system into thinking it's in charge. And so it's about the size of an almond. And so I say to people, imagine an almond in the palm of your hand or put one there and look at it. And just like that gentleman, close your hand and open it a few times just to get that feeling, close and open. And when you open the third time, Remember that the piece causing you so much grief that you can hold it in your hand. It's small enough to hold in your hand. This isn't you, this is only a tiny piece of you. And so that is, that's the beginning of disrupting the hold that stress has on you. And I came up with this when I was working for veterans, with veterans on post-traumatic stress. And so the other piece of this, you see these two cherries those two cherries, they represent this other structure kind of behind the amygdala called the nucleus accumbens. And there are two, there are multiples. And so if you put two cherries in one hand and an almond in the other, right away, you can see that there's a two to one ratio. And those two cherry-like structures, they're the good, neuro they, they send out the good neurology. They send out the oxytocin and the dopamine they help drive the good neurologies. And there are two of those to every one amygdala. And so really 
the insight is your body is set up to help you balance. And there's two of those to every one almond, one amygdala, because that amygdala is very powerful. But it isn't you. And you have other pieces of your brain, two to one, designed to help counterbalance it and keep you in, in good balance. And I have memory here. So the seahorse, because hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. And we call this structure the hippocampus because it kind of looks like one. And this is the gateway of memory. This is where the beginning of memory happens. And this is how stuff comes out. And you notice that these are all bundled together in very tight proximity in our brains. And that's why we are so vulnerable to stress and emotion and anxiety. And we can be overcome by those, but they're also great tools in our neurologies. And when you know that, having that kind of an anchor when things get complicated, this is a good way to bring yourself back or to help bring somebody else back. The second strategy to loosen the grip of anxiety is called for now, otherwise known as when grammar is good for your mental health. And I came up with this one on a retreat. I was leading adults and we were out on a hike in northern New Mexico, you know, glorious bluebird day. And a particular person was sitting on a rock on a break. And it was one of those long sentences, you know, the ticker tape that has no breath. And when this person kind of stopped that really long supercalifragilisticexpialidocious sentence, I looked at her and I said, the next, the next piece of this, at the end of the sentence, I want you to say for now, period. And she kind of looked at me. And she laughed and she said something next. And she said, for now, period. And I said, breathe. And she laughed. And I said, do you know what you just did? I said, you just talked your body down. You just punctuated that sentence, full stop, period. You told your body there's an end. And the end of it right now might just be the punctuation on the end of that sentence, but it stopped the run-on sentence. It stopped the endless self-talk that was making her spiral down. And no matter what's going on, if you can put those two words at the end of the sentence in your mind, you're telling your body, this might not be good, but it's for now. It's just for now. And Again, using your eyes to help your brain, your senses can override each other, that kind of self-talk, you can literally stop something in its tracks. Full stop, for now. And so, are you ready? Mind wandering, procrastination, certain kinds of off-task behavior, are all beneficial to the processes of learning and creativity. Recognizing that those are aspects of what we call the resting state in the brain can allow you to reframe moments that might appear to be unproductive and capitalize on downtime for better quality of learning and comfortable learning environment. Okay, Play prepares people to deal constructively and appropriately with the novel and unexpected. The ultimate goal of learning is to attain and develop knowledge, skill, and flexibility to be ready to adapt and apply knowledge during unexpected and expected moments. All right, so this is a really big misunderstanding that we have to overturn. Distraction and procrastination are thought to be the enemies of learning and achievement. We've created a false dichotomy between pleasure and learning. And we've underestimated what happens during downtime, off-task behavior, and distraction. So in the beginning of my talk, I said, we are all suffering in the name of education, and it's supposed to be the thing that makes everything better. And so why are we suffering? This is one of the reasons that we are suffering. 
and I pulled these little comics together. Um, here we have an instant gratification monkey and a rational decision maker, okay? And the instant gratification monkey says, I want to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. And the rational decision maker says, no, you must follow, you know, you must follow the leader and follow instructions. And so then you come over here to the dark playground, play, 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 play. No, no internet, no phone, no computer, no music. Yes, walk, meditate, reflect, and journal. These, they're really false dichotomies because in moments of play and distraction, your brain's doing other hard things. And in school, we say, don't look out the window. Don't mind, your mind is wandering. Come back to what I want you to do. Come back to what you're supposed to do. What you need to know is that there's a very important process in our brain underneath all of the things that we do effortfully. You know, the brain reading, calculating, driving, cooking, all the things you do on a daily basis that are action-based. But underneath that system, you have another one called the resting state. And that's a misnomer because it's also very busy, but it's the autonomic system of your brain. It's like, your lungs respirating and your heart beating. You don't have to tell those processes to do their thing. They just do it. And so this is the brain's way of keeping homeostasis. And this is a slide of what it looks like um, from a study that I was a part of in a collaboration with Georgetown and Johns Hopkins. And TD stands for typically developing kids. This was in children, children with autism. But our, our kids who were typically developing um, during functional MRI, they were doing attention tasks, playing some logic games. But when you look at the brain in between the places where they're playing those games, you always take images of the brain where they're not doing anything at all. And that's when you see the resting state. So all of these red areas, so frontal lobes, uh, back in the sensory cortex, here where thoughts and emotions come together in language. Um, these all, they're all red in typically developing kids because that system is meant to be very cohesive. It's like the brain telling itself a story. But in autism spectrum, which is this composite brain underneath, you see all of these different colors because the resting state is influenced by diagnosis and mental illness. And so it doesn't always coordinate uh, the way that it's supposed to. And the brain, you know, part of mental illness really on a neutral way is the brain kind of the different regions operating more independent of one another than they're meant to be. There are different pieces that kind of have this separate agency. And in autism, um, autism is just the sensory cortex trying to do the job of the whole brain. And you wonder, you see sensory overload in people with autism, and that's because the part of the brain that takes in the five senses thinks it can do all the hard problem solving, generate emotion. Um, it thinks it can do everything, and it tries to do everything early in life until development kind of takes over and those pathways develop and go to different addresses, and they get there in different times. And so you get these differences within the brain and how it's connected. Um, but that's all it is. It's just the sensory cortex trying to do the job of the whole brain. So this is another slide showing you what the resting state looks like, only looking at the brain like as if you were slicing it like a loaf of bread. And the, the point of this slide is that the brain wants stories and when none are available, it makes its own. And so this functional system, this autonomic system of our brain is really a brain kind of talking to itself and shifting. And from a recovery point of view, this is where imagination comes from. This is where we're able to think retrospectively, but plan for the future, see the future, become motivated by something outside of ourselves and beyond ourselves. And so knowing that it's there is really important because it's another part of our good neurology that 
up until very recently, we didn't know it was there. For a long time, cognitive neuroscience, we knew it was there. We didn't know what it did. And now that we're starting to get that glimpse that, hmm, this is the gateway where novelty enters the brain and can be used. You know, imagination and creativity are visioning things that don't exist yet and solving problems and creating new things in, in the service of a difficulty. And it turns out that's where the that's where the trap door is in the closed system that keeps us functioning in our brains and our bodies. And so let's see, we I'm running late, so I'm going to skip um, this slide, but I want to talk a little bit in the last few minutes about connection and that back to that pinky high five and what happens when you can shift somebody from rumination and being stuck within themselves and bring them back out, whether it's with an analytical problem for their mind um, or some exercise or flexibility. And this, this is the visual that goes with what I was talking about earlier, that when we are connected in a web um, and comfortable there, and comfortable is I know what I need to do I might not know deeply all of the information I need, but I know where to get it. And I had a, a mentor in grad school within the first month tell me, you don't always have to know everything, but you need to know where it is. And if you can do that and balance what you know with where things are that you will need, you'll always be comfortable. And turns out the brain, <clears throat> the brain feels the same way because when you're working in a hierarchy that isn't supportive, your working memory is what gets taxed. You get loaded up with demands. I'm doing my thing. Am I doing it right? Am I going to get criticized? Is it going to go up the pole the right way? All of those different things tax the load system. But when you are comfortable within a network, you can solve that same problem, only you're going to, your brain is going to dig into the deeper pieces of the frontal lobes that match um, your own sense of safety and ability and expertise with what the problem space is. And it's a way more efficient from an energetic point of view. It's a, it's, you're, you're a better problem solver. And in lab studies and in our lab study, what we looked at um, neuroimaging um, that we were able to see that while a person could do the problem, whether they were working in a pecking order or a network, that their brains had different preferences in those external structures. So that speaks to the, the educational psychology. Does the environment fit the learner and does it promote what they can do or does it inhibit it? And it's a really useful thing to know that in any situation, if you are distracted by an external sensor, you know, what's somebody going to think of me? I feel self-conscious. Am I doing it right? That your frontal lobes are going to take that as load. But if you are comfortable in what you're doing and can draw on resources outside of yourself, your frontal lobes are, are gonna leave the load aside and the, the really good problem solving gears in your mind, they're gonna get on board instead and help you do the same thing. So you might get the same outcome, but the journey is way better and the quality of life along the way is very different between scenario one and scenario two. Hey, Lane, um, I'm going to stop you here because we're like half an hour over time. We <laughs> are. Oh, I thought we had till 730. Sorry. Seven, seven, because then we want to have give people the opportunity to ask questions. Yeah. And I know this is really interesting. I really enjoyed it. But do you have many more slides? Or because we've lost a few people, I think, because they had to leave. But, OK. Um, if you could maybe wrap it up in a couple of minutes and then so that we can give people some time yeah. to ask questions. Sure. So Thanks. 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And I'm sorry, I thought I had till 7.30 to be speaking. Yeah. So um, one, more, one more strategy, one more piece on how to swing yourself um, into connection. And again, this is in service of getting yourself unstuck and resituated or helping somebody else. And if you can remember these three words, protect, check, and inspect. And this came out of um, 
of some research in the organizational psychology literature. And I thought it was really useful because, um, and this is from the book. So it's the students having trouble with team membership and are over-focused on themselves. This could be anybody and anybody in a healthy team in relationship and paying attention to others. And if you wanna flip somebody from being um, focused on themselves to focusing on others, you need to understand that the difference between these two mindsets is a sense of self-protection and preservation, as opposed to being in a situation where you feel like somebody has your back or you have somebody else's back. And so are you protecting yourself or do you have your teammates' backs? Are you keeping a check on yourself to avoid criticism or calling attention to yourself? Or are you helping provide feedback to other people in your team or your group? And then finally inspect is, are you calling people out so you don't, so you don't garner attention, you're gonna say it first, or are you inspecting your own performance in the spirit of collaboration and working for the greater goal at hand? And so this is, this is kind of the last piece on a, one, another strategy that you can use to shift yourself or somebody that you're working with or for into a more constructive space. Okay, all right, Betty, I think this is a really good stopping point. Yeah, this is my last slide right here. The settings that promote flexibility, what promotes readiness and what promotes connection as a summary for tonight's talk. Thank you, Lane. Uh, Dr. K, this was really interesting. I really admire your work. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to take it all in, I'm sure, as everybody else is. Does anybody have any questions? Let me see, I'm not seeing everybody. So if there are any questions, uh, just chime in. Or we lost people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Let me see. I don't see anything in the chat. Do you, Jess? Do you have any questions from um, uh, face, uh, Facebook live stream? Um, we didn't have a question. We had a comment. Uh, someone said, growing up in New Mexico, my kids were told the reason to stay in school was to earn money in the workforce for tomorrow. Your goal is much more persuas persuasive and might even lower the dropout rate. Oh, that's good. Awesome. Yeah. Very positive. Yeah. Anything else from? That was it from Facebook. Okay. Okay. I don't see anybody else raising their hand. Uh, do I? If I'm not seeing anybody, because I've only seen uh, parts of the photo gallery. I want to thank um, Dr. Kalbflisch for this excellent presentation. I can see the amount of work that went into this. And like I said, really admire your work. And thank you again for um, speaking to NAMI Santa Fe um, and joining our very excellent um, group of people that have presented to us. You know, uh, we've had some great speakers, you being one of them. And I think everybody looks forward to to hearing you when you come to speak to us. So thanks again, Lane. Anytime. Thank you so much, everyone.